Open your Bibles with you, with me, will you please, to uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 3. Philippians 3, verse 3. And I'm reading from New King James. It says, For we are the circumcision, who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Amen. morning. I do have a disclaimer. I just want to tell you up front that I haven't been trained in writing or giving sermons, nor am I especially gifted in writing sermons, but I am in the position of an elder, wherein something I have to do once in a while is give a sermon. So often I rely on, I Wait a minute. So oftentimes I rely on inspiration from sermons I've heard, articles I've read, not necessarily on just materials that I've developed by myself. And this is kind of a standard practice, I think, but uh, just claiming it ahead of time. I got this part of this sermon from a, 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 another person. And uh, sometimes I read or hear sermons that speak to me, and I want to share them with you. And sometimes I don't have that opportunity, and sometimes it just goes out of my head, but uh, you're in my thoughts. And I share today a touch of something that came to me, but we mostly have others to thank, and the Lord who inspires them, that I or we might share with you. So we're going to be looking at, in Philippians today, do you remember as a child nursery rhymes, Humpty Dumpty? Sat on the wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty back together again. What a strange thing to read to a child. I, I have this mental picture of poor little Humpty Dumpty, skinny little legs and arms being cracked. His shell is all cracked and the yokes running all over. And the horses and the men just are just standing around. And they couldn't put Humpty together again. Why didn't somebody call 911? Actually, if you read this story, it came from 1657. And the way you read it today is not the way it originally written. There's no mention of any shell or egg portion. And nobody really knows who this poem is about, but it's supposed to be George, King of England, but that's only a hypothesis. We don't know for sure. So if you look it up, you'll find that the version you have learned is not the original version. What about three blind mice? It's a little worse yet. See how they run? Exactly how do blind mice run? They grab the wall or... Yeah, I've got a picture of little white, little white mice, probably. Little gray mice. They got little dark glasses on, little white canes running frantically all around. They run after the farmer's wife. How did they know where the farmer's wife was? They were blind. She cuts off their tails with a carving knife. Have you ever seen such a sight in your life? No. That's three blind mice. As your mother tucks you into bed, oh, good night, sweetheart. Fat chance. This is the stuff nightmares are made of. And if you think about all these nursery rhymes, often it's hard to find, I think, a, a baby cradle and it falls with the bio breaks. I mean, <laughs> give me a break. It turns out the nursery rhyme, they've been around for a long time, 16th century and on. And it's derived from a true story, the one about three blind mice. The farmer's wife is Queen Mary, number one. Kathleen, Queen of England. Do you know her nickname? Her nickname is Bloody Mary. Now you remember a little bit 
about history. The three blind mice are Anglican martyrs that refused to recant their beliefs and were burned at the stake. It's a religious issue, three blind mice. Hugh Latimer, Nicholas Ridley, and Thomas Cranmer were the gentlemen that would recant. And these are just some of the people in the history of the world that have stood up for what they believe and sacrificed all for God and for his word and for what they believe in him. We also have about the same time John Wesley, John Huss, Jerome of Prague, which his name is not spelled anything like that. I couldn't even pronounce his full name, and Vicky wouldn't type it, so I'm not going to even try. John Calvin, Huldrych Zwingli, Martin Luther, all who wouldn't recant their beliefs in God, willing to die or sacrifice a normal life to fulfill what God had called them to do for him by spreading the gospel. We're going to look this morning at Paul in Philippians, who is at the same time in the same place as these gentlemen were. Take out your Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 3. Remember Paul's in jail. He's facing a trial and they're trying to decide whether or not to execute him. Now the Bible doesn't tell us exactly how Paul did die. But if we look at other sources, generally it is believed that Paul died about two or three years after this letter was written in Rome, where he was beheaded. So this was just getting towards the end of Paul's life when he wrote to the church at Philippi. Now in chapter 3, there's a little title. What does it say? Some say, no confidence in the flesh. Mine says, pressing towards the mark. About the same topic. Paul's not saying, it's about me. I have no confidence in the flesh. If we said that to people today, they'd go, what do you mean, it's not about me? Of course it's all about me. It's always all about me. We live in a very self-centered society where everything is about numero uno. And we could look at Paul's life and we could say, has he achieved some measure of success? I can remember the television commercials from the 60s about grabbing the gusto and it's, it was all about me. The barn grill man, it's all about me. It's getting worse. Paul is famous. Some people love him, some people hate him. But everybody knows who he is. People have listened to him. At least the Christians have listened. He's had a great impact on what's going on in the Christian church. He's had success. But yet he says, it's not about me. I have no confidence in the flesh. He's had success, but he says, it's not about me. Do you think when this letter arrives, the Church of Philippi, that they read it carefully? I mean, like, very carefully? We're still scrutinizing that letter today, aren't we? How carefully everybody gathered around as they studied what it says and what it means, what Paul was instructing them to do. And yet he says, but it's not about me. Like I said, in today's society, we always think it's about us. I need to go to school. I need to get a good job. I need a good job so I can make lots of money. I need lots of money so I can have a big house. I need to buy a big house because everybody else is buying one. Sometimes we don't even know why we're doing what we are doing. I've just got to keep up with the Joneses. Do you see that in society today? That happens quite a bit. People have problems to go to the store to buy things. Buying satisfies their need. We're in a hurry because we're doing more important than what everybody else is doing. And they're preventing us from getting our things done. They're preventing us from getting 
our to-do list. Do you make a list? Do you have a little to-do list of things you want to accomplish? We all do at times. We don't always, but we do at times. They're slowing us down. It takes time to check them off the list, you know. How many stories we've heard about people who chase the dream and they get it and then what they're looking for they've got in their hand whether it's fame riches president of a company or whatever they've accomplished it they got what they're looking thing looking for but there's still a hole inside you're happy but you're not happy they're empty it doesn't fill everything and Paul was telling us in this chapter there's something more it's not just about me it's not just about you it's not about what we can accomplish there's something more to it part of this self is self-preservation it's good to have a self sense of self-preservation if you go to the internet and you watch YouTube videos, you can see accidents that are about to happen. People who are diving out of the way as cars careen through an intersection. There's some pretty phenomenal ones that are taken from cameras that are on intersection and stuff, and it's amazing that they actually escape. It's better to move than to stand there and get struck by a truck or a bus or a motorcycle. Self-preservation is good. But what Paul is talking about here is more than self-preservation. He's talking about the need to be less self-controlled. Let's look at verse 3 of chapter, th chapter 3 in Philippians. And it says, For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus who put no confidence in the flesh, although I myself have such reason for confidence. Paul is saying, listen, this is not about us. We should not have confidence in the flesh. But if you want to talk about that, it's okay with me because he says, if someone else thinks that they have the reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church, and as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Paul was his own man, wasn't he? He thought that everything he did for the church was his duty. Paul has the Ivy League diploma on the wall. You can't out-Jew or out-Christian Paul. He's at the top of the heap. He comes from the tribe of Benjamin. That's a favorite tribe. His name was Saul after King Saul, the first king of Israel, who came from the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Pharisee. He had zeal in persecuting the church. He had kept the law and been faultless. Paul is at the top of his class. He has set the standard and everybody else is somewhere below that. And yet, he says, it's not all about me. Let's look at verse 7. But whatever was gained to me, I now consider a loss for the sake of Christ. What has Paul gained exactly? He's in jail. Probably chained to two guards. He probably can't write because of the chains, but he's dictating the letter to somebody else to write it for him. He has no home. What has Paul gained? What has Paul lost? See, when you read Paul, you've got to stop and think. It's just not like a story. You've got to stop and think. Paul's a little difficult at times to understand, isn't he? So you have to really think and try to wrap around what he's trying to tell us. What's happening? What does Paul gain? What has Paul lost? What Paul is talking about here is purpose. 
What is the purpose of all of this? Why do we do this? How many of you know the purpose of your life? Don't raise your hand. I mean, really, what is the purpose of your life? Stop and think about it. What is the purpose? What are you here for? It's a common question. A lot of people ask this. What is my purpose? What's my reason for being? Why am I here? If I were to look at your to-do list, the things you want to get done, would I be able to see the purpose of your life? Would it be on the list? If you look at my to-do list, it's full of stuff. Get the garden done. Prepare a Sabbath school lesson. Get a sermon ready, like today. Cut firewood. Keep the vehicles running. Is that the purpose of my life? What is our purpose? To get married? Reproduce? Make little mini-me's? Raise them up? Take them to soccer and baseball? Band and all those other things? That's good stuff, right? But is that the purpose of your life? What is the purpose of your life? What are you here for? See, because when you know what the purpose of your life is, you know why you do the things you do. Some of us are here, are employed and have jobs. Is that your purpose? You're an owner of a business. You have an eight to five job. I hope that's not just your purpose. Please don't put those on my tombstone. That's not the purpose of my life. That's what I do just to make money. Paul was a tent maker to make money, so he had a job. But that wasn't his purpose in life. There's no museum that you can go to and say, hey, there's a tent made by Paul. That wasn't the purpose of it. What is the purpose? Why are you here? It's a question that's worthy of careful consideration. Why are you here? What are we doing? Is it to get a job, climb the company ladder, make lots of money, retire early, 15 minutes of fame on the YouTube video that went viral? No, why are you here? Paul proclaims his reason for being here with these words. In verse 10, it says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. That's from the NIV. What, Paul, what does Paul think his purpose is? To know Christ. Paul's purpose is not to be an apostle, not to be a preacher and write half of the New Testament. Paul's purpose is to know Christ and become like him. Here's how the Amplified Bible states it. And this so that I may know him experientially, becoming more thoroughly acquainted with him, understanding the remarkable wonders of his person more completely, and in the same way experience the power of his resurrection, which overflows and is active in believers, and that I may share the fellowship of his sufferings by being continually conformed inwardly into the likeness even to his death, dying as he did, so that I may obtain, attain to the resurrection that will raise me from the dead. The Amplified puts in lots of words, so we get a pretty good understanding of what he's trying to say. So it's pretty straightforward. Paul spent his whole life trying to know Christ better become like him, and drag a few people with him along the way. And that was his purpose in life. Verse 12 says, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. 
Paul's saying, I haven't done it yet. I haven't accomplished my goal of knowing Christ and reflecting him the way that I want to. Apostle Paul said he doesn't know Christ fully the way he wants to. Shouldn't this be our reason for existence? To know Christ and become a little more like him and drag a few people along with us? Amen. Verse 13 and 14, Paul says, But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. We could do the whole sermon on this text. In fact, I'm sure the people have done a series of sermons on this text. There's lots, it's packed, there's lots of stuff in there. One, we need to forget what is behind. It's a hard thing to do sometimes, isn't it? It's not about me. I don't know how, Christian, how many Christians I've talked to or how many adults I've talked to that are haunted by something that has happened to them maybe back in the first, second, or third grade. We need to forget that which is behind us now. Some of us have had some horrible things happen to us. And I understand that forgetting is difficult. But we've got to forget what's behind, especially the small stuff. When I was in the third grade, someone said something that was mean about me. Or even last week, someone said mean about, something mean about me. Or unkind to me. Get over it. It's okay. We've got to forget the stuff that is behind us and strive towards the things that are ahead of us. God is a whole lot less concerned about your past and a whole lot more concerned about your future and what is ahead of you. We can change from the past and look forward to the future. Some of us have had some very spectacular public failures. There have been addictions, there's been drugs, there have been alcohol, there have been jail, there have been failed marriages, failed businesses, bankruptcy, and hundreds of other things. Some of us have had some very public failures, and you can't change it. They've happened. Everybody knows about it, and you can't change it. You can't go back and fix it. I mean, we've tried. It doesn't work. You can't fix it. The only thing you can do is learn from it and strive, press forward to what's ahead. That's all can be done. And Paul realizes this. We must move forward. So many pe people today are concerned about moving too fast and forward, and we do everything in a hurry. We're in a hurry. We're in a race. We got to go. We got to do this. We got to do that. Fast food. We stand at the microwave. Come on, come on, come on. It takes 20 Seconds to a minute to heat up your food, and you're standing there going, hurry up, hurry up. I know I walked to the other room the other night. I put on something for four minutes. I walked to the other room. I came back, and I still had 47 seconds to go, and I heard myself, and I already wrote this down. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. We are in a hurry. We're used to things happening now, aren't we? We get upset to the drive-in, drive through because the guy ahead of us ordered a whole bunch of food and it takes him five minutes to get it unloaded into his car and pay for it. We get in a hurry. Here's another one. Have you ever gone out to lunch with somebody and you're just barely getting into the meal and they say, excuse me, I gotta go, and they jump up and dismiss themselves and off they go? They have something else to do, obviously more important. Really? Do we have to be in such a hurry? No, we don't have to be in such a hurry. Richard Twitz, a uh, Laconian Indian, shared this insight. He says, for Euro-Americans, time is quantitative. To the Native American, time is qualitative. The Euro-American time is quantitative. We care about how much we have. I've got to do this, I've got to do that. I don't have time to do this. I don't have time to do that. I don't have time to watch my favorite TV program, so I'll put it on DVR, DVD, DVR 
so I can watch it later because, of course, there's more time later. I try to squeeze in as much as I can. I got to do this, I got to do that. The Native American, time is qualitative. The quality of time matters. We've all experienced these quality times and wish we could experience them again and more often. When I sit in the quiet and I read my Bible, I lose my focus if something or someone interrupts me. The quality is broken. But if it's not broken, I come away refreshed and fulfilled. That is quality time, and I make that happen most, almost every day if I choose to. Who benefits, me or Christ? I do, mostly, in my mind. But God does, too, because he knows then that I've put the word in my heart, and I seek to know him and to follow him. He's watching. It's not about me. It's about him. An elderly Indian was asked if he had lived his whole life on the reservation. He didn't answer immediately, but when he did, he says, no, not yet. Very insightful answer. No, not yet. I have more life to live. There are more experiences for me to experience. There is more left to do. Not to be in a hurry. But things for me to do with experience to encounter. More time left. King David says to be still and know that I am God. What is your purpose? It is not to come to church every Saturday morning and sit in the pew for 50 years. That's not your purpose in life. Now, there's nothing wrong with coming to church and sitting in the same pew, but that's not your purpose in life. God wants us to discover him, to be like him, to put forth some effort to drag a few people along. You want to drag them along with us. On the way, you can't do this by sitting on your pew for 50 years. You got to get up. You got to get involved. You got to go to prayer meeting. You've got to volunteer to do things. Some of you are going to say, well, I just don't know what to do. Well, remember, it's not about you. It's about Christ in you and what he can do. When I first started going to church, I never taught a Sabbath school class. I had never preached a sermon. I hadn't taken any classes on how to do such things. When you work in an automotive machine shop, they don't teach you that stuff. They teach you bad stuff, actually. You can solve mechanical problems. You use those skills to help others. But when you volunteer and get involved in a church, you learn new things. You will find things that you're good at and some things that you're not so good at. You will say, you know what? I can't do that, but I can do this. Find your purpose of how you're going to go, <clears throat> or how you're going to know Christ and become more like him. And how are you going to drag others along with you? Paul is a preacher. Not all of us are meant to be preachers. That's okay. But how are you going to fulfill your purses, purpose of knowing Christ, becoming like him, and dragging people along you, with you on the way? A question that's worthy, it is, it's a question that's worthy of careful consideration. Paul did it. We can do it. So it's really not about me. It's about Christ in me the hope of glory. I've used the phrase drag along with you on purpose. It sounds uncaring, haphazard, and without intent. Paul doesn't mean it that way, and neither does Jesus. Paul says in Philippians 3, 14 through 21, and we'll read that at this time. I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if anything, 
and if anything ye be otherwise minded, God should reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Christ Jesus, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. And then we want to look at Matthew 28. We'll be looking at verses 17, 18, and 19. And you can probably all recite these. I'm just going to read the red words. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. And then back to Philippians, as we look for the power to accomplish these things because sometimes they're new to us. 413, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. So the power is available to us. All we have to do is ask for it. I have used this phrase drag along with you on purpose. It sounds a little uncaring. But I already read that, didn't I? Yeah, that part. So these things that, I, that we've been asked to do are not uncaring or haphazard. They are purposeful. Caring for others, looking out for them, sharing the gospel with them, becoming their friend, giving them rides to church or activities, or to the store or to the doctor's office. That shows people the type of things that Paul and Jesus would do. Here's another way than the world portrays. We can choose which way is best for us, be looking at the world and following what it does, or we can look at the Bible and follow what it says. The world's way is about me. The Bible's way is about, not about me, but about others. Not about the world's way, about me. Bible's way, about others others the world's way is death the Lord's way is life if we care about life we will choose the Lord's way we will share Jesus with others like Paul did we will win their confidence show them a better way to live the well known quote by Mrs. White from Ministers Healing says Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching people the Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them, follow me. If they accept the true love of ours and our willing sacrifice for them, they haven't been dragged along but have been led to the feet of Jesus by you. You have done what Jesus has asked you to do. You have given of yourself as Jesus and Paul did, that they may have life. The reward is well worth it now as well as later. See, I told you it wasn't about me. It's about others. Now go to work. We'll close with a song, number 308.
306. 308 was the first one. And you should stand, please. Heavenly Father, do draw us nearer, Lord, that we might become more like you. That we may be ready to go about your business, to accomplish the task at hand, to be your representative. We need to trust totally in you. So, Lord, help us to have purpose in our life to bring others to the Lord. We pray and thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen.